I'm Si Yuan Yu. I'm, uh, I'm an upcoming fourth year medical student at Cooper University in Jersey. And I'm Rasika Sadarshan. I'm a first year medical student at USC in California. Today, we're going to be presenting our journal article titled Patients with Benign Carry One Malformations Require Surgical Decompression at the Low Rate by uh, Leon and all at uh, University of Alabama. Okay, so we don't have any disclosures. So we'll go and get started. So just a brief introduction. So carry one, uh, sorry, carry malformation is really a mix of etiologies. And one thing that all the pathophysiologies of uh, carry malformations have in common is that there's a flow of CSF obstruction at the level of a uh, frame and row, and that gives rise to the different causes and etiologies of the various types. And as you can see here in the right upper corner, there's already four different classifications of Chiari malformation. But today we're really gonna focus on Chiari 1 malformation. And the reason we're doing that is because Chiari 1 malformation is the most common in kids and adults. And as you can see here in the right lower corner, here's a brief description of a Chiari 1 malformation. Chiari 1 malformation is usually associated with a headache. And this is according to the international class classification that have the, of uh, headache disorders, um, the DER version. So a Chiari 1 headache is usually a sub uh, suboccipital or occipital headache, and it's characterized by short durations, and is usually provoked by some kind of increased intracranial pressure, such as coughing or valsalva-like movements. And when we look further into the diagnostic criteria, we see that Chiari 1 malformation is usually has to be demonstrated on some type of imaging, usually MRI. And what we see is that the cellular, the, the cerebellum tonsil usually herniates about five centimeters or more. That's usually the diagnostic criteria for a Chiari 1 malformation. And when we look into some of the characteristics of the headaches, like I mentioned before, is precipitated by Melsalva uh, movement, occipital less than five minutes. And it's usually associated with, uh, the headache is usually associated with the discovery of Chiari 1 malformation. And two other caveats we want to point out is that uh, in addition to the headache, a lot of patients with carry one malformation can have cerebellar symptoms, can have uh, motor symptoms, as well as cranial nerve symptoms associated with the headache. And lastly, when we make the diagnosis, we want to make sure that the headache is not uh, associated with another type of headache, such as uh, uh, chronic migraines. Okay, so this is uh, the signs and symptoms in patients presenting with carry one malformation, uh, as doc, uh, noted by uh, Dr. Greenberg, and we see here is that the most common uh, si symptoms, including headache, weakness, numbness, and the signs usually include hyperactivity of, um, as well as um, cranial nerve signs. So cranial nerve signs, as well as upper motor neuron signs. Okay, so we have already briefly mentioned about the diagnostic criteria of classical symptoms, such as the headache, as well as the imaging findings of uh, CSF flow obstruction. And as you can see here is a picture that we see of this patient with Chiari 1 malformation where their cerebral tonsil herniated 10, mil, uh, 10 millimeter below the foramen magnum. Well, that is, well, it is easy to make the, well, well, it is classic to make the diagnosis when the patient has the classic symptoms as well as the imaging findings, it becomes much more difficult when, uh, when we have uh, patients that have imaging findings of Chiari 1 malformation while, while they do not necessarily have all the symptoms. And as you can see here, some of the studies have shown that prevalence of Chiari 1 malformation uh, by imaging diagnostic criteria can be as high as 3.6% within the general population, right? So here's the question that the authors try to, uh, try to address is that what is the optimal management when patients have Chiari 1 malformation, but they don't have a clear indication for surgery, right? Either they're incidentally found when the patients have no symptoms or they're minimally symptoms, right? They have a headache, but it's not specific. So what do we do in those cases? And here's what some of the authors have tried to address in, their, in the selected studies. So here are three studies where the authors included uh, patients with Chiari 1 malformation, where they do not have the symptoms uh, necessitating a Chiari 1 sur a surgical intervention. Therefore, they were followed up from um, four years up to, all the way up to 11 years. As you can see here, most patients, when you do not have these classical symptoms, they rarely need a surgical intervention, as you can see here in the third column. And what a conclusion of each, each author is that conservative management can be, uh, can be used for these patients. However, uh, another caveat that's important to bring up is that each of these individual uh, cohort studies included patients with a syrinx. And the, so the syrinx is essentially a spinal fluid cavity uh, within the spinal cord. And if you see the syrinx along with a um, uh, imaging diagnostic criteria of Chiari 1 malformation, 
that is to some surgeons an indication for surgery. So therefore, um, the uniqueness of the study by Lee and all is ready to address this question that if you're asymptomatic or you're minimally symptomatic and you have these patients without an associated syrinx on imaging, but they do have a diagno diagnosis, a cure one malformation by imaging criteria, what do we do for these patients? And here's what the study tries to address. All right, so I'm gonna go over the methods of the study that they used. Um, so this was a cohort study and the manuscript was prepared using the strobe uh, checklist, which I have shown here. The strobe checklist basically just walks us through different categories on the actual manuscript. And one category that I found really insightful was the bias category, as we can see the authors themselves talk about any supposed bias and sources of bias in this paper. And then, so the next most important part of the methods was the patient inclusion criteria, which is beautifully diagrammed in this flow, flow diagram on the right. Um, so initially we started off with 1755 patients and they were identified by the ICD-9 codes to be potentially part of the final cohort for the study. Um, patients were excluded um, as the goal of the study was to identify asymptomatic or very minimally symptomatic KRE1 malformation patients. Um, patients were then excluded if they were diagnosed with something other than CM1 or if they were not evaluated by a neurosurgeon, which was one of their criteria identified early on in the paper. And going down the list here, we have more exclusions based on missing appointments or if they developed symptoms or had any of them during their initial evaluation, like hydrocephalus, syrinx, tussive headaches, speech or swallowing difficulties, or extremity numbness. Um, and then for the statistical analysis in this paper, they used multivariate logistical logistic regression and patients who had surgery were analyzed and compared with those who didn't have surgery with the following um, criteria, age at initial evaluation, the duration of surgery free follow-up, sex, race, and insurance type, and then we'll go over the results next. All right, so the results here, we'll start with the multivariate analysis results, which are in table four presented on the right side. Um, so this indicates that there wasn't really a difference in a significant difference between patients or between age, sex, and insurance, whether or not they had surgery or not. Um, as the important part of this paper is identifying how many um, patients of minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic CM1 patients, if they had surgery or not over time. Um, basically, there wasn't really a difference in how like these variables affected their supposed uh, probability of having surgery over time. The median follow-up of uh, the medium follow-up for these patients was also 25 and a half months overall. And again, there was no significant difference in these variables. All right, so then surgical outcomes. This table then summarizes how many of the patients of the final cohort of 427 patients actually ended up having surgery. And the table, table three here, summarizes the reasons which, for which they needed surgery, some of which include having a test of headache or having scoliosis or having sleep apnea. Um, and so totally there were 15 patients out of 427, which was three and a half percent of this total patient cohort who required surgical intervention. And um, basically of those, of those 15 patients, most of them did improve after surgery, but then we had two patients with scoliosis, two patients with abducens nerve palsy, and two with non tessive headaches who did not improve after surgery. And then finally, we have the Kaplan-Meier analysis curve here. Um, this graph on the x-axis demonstrates time in months, and then it goes from zero to 120 or 140 months, so about 10 years. And then on the y-axis, we have the proportion free of Chiari decompression. So at time zero, we have um, none of the patients needing surgery, so we are at 100% there. And then over time, um, at about three years, so like 36 months, we have 95.8% of the patients that need surgery at that time and didn't have any decompressions. And then at all the way till 10 years at 120 months, we have 93.1% of the total patient population cohort didn't need surgery. And then the other approximately 7% did. Yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, essentially the results of the study. And some, now we're just gonna briefly discuss some of the limitations in the future directions we thought were, um, you know, to possibly you know, improve upon the paper. So first of all, like, uh, uh, we, when we talked about the strobe record, we, we thought that the studies were very well reported, was very easy to follow. They tried to address some of their sources of own bias, such as their own selection bias that came with the paper. And they also made a really uh, nice diagram to follow. So we know, we, we know exactly how many patients were excluded at, at each individual step. So overall, I thought that was very, we thought it was very great. So some of the limitations we thought was that 
Uh, all the all the 427 patients that were diagnosed with CM1 were both were based off of prior radiology reports, and we know that different radiologists can have different criteria per se of diagnosing it. So I thought would have been uh, what would have probably made a better selection if the the center's own radiologists were to look at those individual films and make the diagnosis based off uh, making the CM1 diagnosis based off their own judgment. I thought that would probably made the paper stronger, but at the same time, it would be a very tedious effort. So we do understand that. And in terms of the median follow-up, uh, it was about, two, you know, about a little, little bit over two years. And if you uh, refer back to the, the chart that, that we showed prior was that some of the studies followed them four years and one of the studies followed them for 11 years. So in, in comparison, this is shorter compared to previous uh, published studies. Uh, in addition, some of the prior natural history studies uh, talked about how many patients uh, uh, needed surgical intervention at a specific time point. At the same time, they also mentioned how many patients had spontaneous resolution of their um, or their cranial uh, of their uh, CM1 malformation. And what had been shown in the literature is actually that some patients with carry one malformation on follow-up imaging can actually spontaneous resolve of their carry one malformation. So I thought this would be a nice information to have in addition to everything else the paper addressed. And lastly, what we thought was that uh, their scheme of following up patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic uh, care one malformation was to see them initially, follow them for one year, and if they're asymptomatic, follow them for three years, and if they're asymptomatic, then follow them for seven years. And we're just, we, we're just wondering if this is an effective strategy of uh, monitoring these patients, because as we can see, from the study, over 250 more patients were lost to follow up. Although we do agree that you know patients are going to lose to follow up regardless. Uh, you know, I think a future direction they could look into is what is the optimum screening strategy for these patients to minimize calls while while also maximize retention rate for follow up of patients. So, in conclusion, we thought um, uh, the papers were very well written, and as uh, previous findings have shown that. Study, uh, this study by Leonor has also demonstrated that patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic uh, KR1 malformation without a syrinx. Again, that's the important point, the without a syrinx. And they mostly follow a benign course with 3.5% requiring surgical intervention over, as the entire cohort. And we also need to emphasize that the rate of freedom from posterior decompression is over 93%. Again, only 7% of patients and only needing surgery at 10 year follow up. And future studies are needed to characterize what is the best imaging interval to screen uh, this set of patients with care one malformation. And that is our presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. That was a, a really nice job of reviewing that paper. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. While I'm talking, uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions about this paper that they want to raise, feel free to put them in the chat box or raise your hand and we can unmute you. All right, so um, so for this first paper, as you both pointed out, uh, this was put out by the group in Birmingham, and they've amassed this tremendous experience with carry malformations, and they've written a, a number of really excellent papers about their experience as an institution. And the reason I like this paper in particular is because as med students, I do think that you get used to seeing the cases that go to the operating room, and that can happen sometimes in training too, in, in residency. Um, but it's equally important to understand that the vast majority of patients with a KRE1 malformation do not end up going to the operating room. It's often found as an incidental finding. It's often found on uh, imaging workup for some unrelated reason. And being able to identify those patients who are truly symptomatic and truly need to go to the operating room from those who can be watched safely is important. And so a paper like this that shows that there is such a thing as a benign KRE1 malformation and that the vast majority of those uh, can be watched, but do not end up going to the operating room, I think is, is really helpful. Um, I, I agree with a lot of the points that you both made. I, I do think that one of the other challenges for a paper like this, whenever we talk about papers that are describing um, the criteria for surgery or what is the rate of patients going on to get surgery, it's really important to understand that different surgeons and different institutions have different thresholds for surgery. And so, uh, you know, another example of that is the MOMS trial, which you may have heard of. That was the uh, trial that looked at prenatal repair of myeloma seal. 
And one of the outcomes that they were interested in was how often do these kids end up going on to get shunts for hydrocephalus. And what they ended up finding was that it was a multi-institutional study and that uh, some of the surgeons at some of the centers had different thresholds for when they would place a VP shunt. And so they actually went back and did another analysis where they, not, they looked not at who went on to get a shunt, but who went on to develop the criteria for needing a shunt according to the leaders of the study. And it's really a similar concept here. I think that um, it, there's a difference between saying who ends up going on to need a Chiari decompression versus who ended up getting one. You know, we saw that some of the patients in this cohort did not improve. Um, I think the authors did do a very good job of defining what they felt uh, were the criteria for needing surgery. But I think it is important to recognize that there's some variability among different centers. And when you look at some of the other papers that are out there, uh, if you're ever interested as, as a student at looking at what is the cross-sectional institutional practices across the country or across the world in regards to surgery for a specific problem, a lot of people have done studies about that and they've put out these, uh, these survey papers. And just a few of them here for Chiari's include um, one that was looking at the section on pediatric neurological surgery back in uh, 2000. There was another international survey done through the ISBN in 2004, and then they updated that paper more recently. And, uh, and what you'll see in those papers is that when they ask different surgeons, what would you consider as the criteria for needing surgery, there actually is quite a bit of diversity. And so uh, one of the international surveys asked, uh, asked a number of surgeons from different countries, how would you manage an asymptomatic carry one patient without cerebral myelia? And the vast majority, 84% said that they would follow these patients and not recommend surgery. But even then it wasn't to everybody. So, so that even then, uh, which I think a lot of people uh, would say, do not, uh, do not recommend surgery for those patients, wasn't hundred percent. When they offered the same scenarios, figure one, but with a syrinx, a small syrinx, only two millimeters wide, which some people would just call a prominent central canal, the number shifted a little bit. And now 28% were recommending surgery, but still the vast majority were recommending follow-up. Now, all of a sudden, you make that a larger syrinx, eight millimeters, and 75% of the surgeons were now recommending uh, a Chiari malformation surgery, a decompression. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's a very interesting series of figures there that show that, yes, the, the signs and symptoms matter, the imaging matters, but a lot of decision making is not uniform. It's rare that you'll find something where 100% of people agree that that is how you should manage that specific patient. And carry one malformations in particular are one of the most controversial uh, types of surgeries that we deal with. There's so many different techniques that people employ and, uh, and even here the threshold for operating can be different. Um, this, this kind of describes the patient population that they were talking about in this paper, management of a carry one patient with pretty benign symptoms. They may have had a suboccipital headache, but there was no stringomyelia. There were no, uh, there were no other concerning signs or symptoms. And you can see that the uh, the decision making was was pretty evenly split, and so I think that that is really what presents us with a challenge when we try to define uh, the natural history of a problem like this. Uh, if you ask a room full of surgeons what they would do for that patient down the road if they developed uh, some symptoms but not others, I think you would find a, a big mixture of answers there. All right, so I think that's, uh, that's all I had to say about this particular paper. I, I think it's, uh, it's an important one to keep in mind when you go on into your neurosurgical careers. Uh, I think it's really important when you see a carry one patient to do a very good examination, get a very good history, uh, and just keep in mind that those patients with quote unquote benign Chiaris, only about 3% of them are gonna go on to end up needing surgery down the road. Um, and so, uh, that might affect your management. I don't think anybody has the perfect answer for how to manage those patients. Like you said, there was a one, three, and seven-year follow-up regimen uh, by the group here. I think everyone has their own style, but that's another question that we really don't have the answer to that would be worth looking at. How do we optimize patient follow-up to make sure that they do continue to check in and that we can catch the few patients who do have a problem without filling the clinic with people who keep coming back year after year uh, and never need anything from us. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Let's see, did we get any 
questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah, no questions so far. Well, thank you all. That was a, a great job on, uh, on reviewing that paper for us. Thank you. Oh, we have a, a question. What are your thoughts on spontaneous resolution of PRA1 malformation? So I, I think that's a great question. Um, there are some other papers that you mentioned uh, that do look at the natural history of PRA1 malformation. Spontaneous resolution has definitely been described. Um, there is a thought that uh, the younger the patient, when you diagnose them, the more likely it might be that they'll develop some imaging changes over time. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, I had a patient earlier this year who uh, was referred to us for a prior imaging finding of a large syrinx. Uh, for whatever reason, she hadn't been referred at the time of the initial MRI a couple of years ago, but she was having headaches and, and they referred her back. We re-imaged her and the syrinx was essentially gone. Uh, and so without any intervention. Um, so that, that is definitely not uh, always the rule, but I think it is important to keep in mind that we still, even today, don't have a great understanding of what the natural history of PRA1 malformation is, uh, but there are papers out there that do suggest that it can fluctuate over time. Good question. All right, so I think um, we're gonna try to spend about 20 minutes or so on each one of these papers. So we're gonna move on to the second paper for tonight, which is uh, a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at the addition of duroplasty to posterior fossa decompression, which is another very hot topic in PRA1 malformations. All right, so Michael, you can go ahead and uh, share your slides whenever you're ready. Okay, there we go. I'm just trying to start my video. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm a first year medical student from the University of Buffalo. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, this study by Victor Liu et al. It's the addition of duroplasty to posterior fossa decompression, um, basically comparing PFDO versus PFDD. And I'll talk about that more. Um, just for some background, uh, the first study gave a, the first presentation gave a, a great background, but um, curing malformation type one is defined as the displacement of the cerebellar tonsils below the level of the frame and magnum. And usually that cutoff is around five millimeters. Uh, it's due to structural abnormalities in the skull or spine leading to that herniation through the frame and magnum. And it's often associated with syringomyelia where in this image here, we see a large uh, spinal syrinx. Um, and the typical presentation is a child or young adult with tussive occipital he headaches, um, which are often intense and inducible. And it can also present with sensory motor deficits and ataxia. And the prevalence has been shown to be as high as 1% in the general population and in just children alone. Um, so there are two main surgical approaches to Chiari malformation type one. Uh, the first of which is uh, posterior fossa decompression only. And the goal of both of these is to remove any obstruction to CSF flow. And you're basically accomplishing that through decompression of this area. And with posterior fossa decompression only, um, a three centimeter by three centimeter occipital craniotomy is usually made and the posterior arch of C1 is also removed to free up space. And um, the posterior arch of C2 is sometimes taken, although that's less common. And this is basically the entire approach of posterior fossa decompression, removing the bone flap, removing the posterior arch of C1, achieving that decompression, and then closing the case. However, uh, taking it a step further, posterior fossa decompression with duraplasty involves incising the dura, and that gives the uh, surgeon the ability to address any intradural pathology that may exist, such as arachnoid veils or obstruction of the outflow from the fourth ventricle. Um, so a durotomy is made, similar to this image here, and that allows the surgeon to address any 
pathology that may lie in there and to um, shrink the cerebellar tonsils with bipolar cautery if needed. Um, the dural opening is then closed with an autograph or allograph dural closure. And last week, Dr. Hankinson mentioned that uh, allografts have been shown to be associated with higher rates of pseudo meningocele and chemical meningitis. So that is something to consider, um, although that wasn't addressed specifically in this study. And being a more invasive approach, there is a possibility for CSF or infectious complications. Um, the aim of this study was to provide an up-to-date comparison of posterior fossa decompression only versus posterior fossa decompression in addition to duroplasty in the surgical treatment of pediatric uh, curare malformation type one. So the methods of the study, um, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis. They utilized the uh, search engines here, such as Ovid, PubMed, Embase, and the others. The terms are listed here. Um, they used a PRISMA approach, um, identifying a total of 804 records and eventually narrowing that down to the 12 studies included in this paper. Um, there was no outside funding and they uh, presented statistics to look for homogeneity um, and the grade assessment to assess the articles that they were including in the study. Uh, so the cohort characteristics, there were a total of 1,963 posterior fossa decompression only patients. Their median age was 9.7. There was uh, 1,492 that underwent PFDD and their mean age was 10.9. And here we see the range of percent male, which varied a bit, but that was not uh, statistically significant. Um, and the mean follow-up period for both groups ranged from immediately post-op evaluation only to as long as 55 months after surgery. Um, so starting to look at the surgical outcomes, uh, four studies reported length of stay the mean difference in length of stay was 0.6 days favoring posterior fossa decompression only. And this was a statistically significant relationship. And um, this was somewhat to be expected given the less invasive nature of the surgical intervention. And um, this really impacts the hospital expenditures um, and that must be taken into consideration when comparing the overall effects of posterior fossa decompression only versus posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty. Next, estimated blood loss was reported by only two studies and found a non-significant uh, effect where there was more blood loss with posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty, which was also somewhat intuitive given the more invasive nature of incising the dura and the venous blood loss that can occur through that. Next, they looked at revision surgery rates. Um, there were a total of 39 revision surgeries, uh, 2% in the posterior fossa decompression only group compared to 3.5% in the posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty. However, this was not statistically significant. And next they compared the posterior post-operative complications overall. The overall complication profiles um, were 11.8% complication rate in posterior fossa decompression only compared to 15% in uh, addition to the duroplasty. So this was a statistically significant effect, um, giving an odds ratio of 1.47 favoring posterior fossa decompression only. And they further broke this down into CSF related and infectious complications. Um, in both the Posterior fossa with, with uh, duroplasty had a higher rate of CSF related complications and infectious complications, which largely relates to the incising of the dura and um, replacing that dura with a allograft or autograft. The, there was a higher odds ratio of infectious complications as well. Uh, as for performance outcomes, they looked at Searing's improvement. This was not a statistically significant effect, but the Searing's improvement did appear to be greater in the posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty. 
which may um, relate to the incising of the dura and um, the ability to address that intradural pathology. Scoliosis improvement. Um, scoliosis is often seen with curing malformation. However, only two studies followed that outcome and the odds ratio was 1.05 and not significant. So that kind of can go either way. Overall clinical improvement favored posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty, the odds ratio of 2.09. And finally, um, we looked at the AMSTAR-2 criteria, which is a appraisal tool for systematic reviews, just as um, like a second check. And overall, we found that they had a low risk of bias within this study. However, within the study, they mentioned that the um, articles included were very low to low quality, meaning they were all uh, retrospective or observational studies, not, nothing prospective. Um, there is a prospective randomized controlled trial currently going on uh, assessing the comparison between posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty and posterior fossa decompression only, and the results of that um, will be highly awaited to see the uh, final results. Great, thank you, Michael. Nice job. Um, you know, I, I think that this is, again, one of those topics that's really widely debated and it has been for years upon years in neurosurgery. Um, you know, we mentioned after the first talk that, uh, carry one malformations are controversial and, and not just who gets surgery, but what kind of surgery do you do? There's so many variations to the surg surgical technique, as I'm sure you heard from Dr. Hankinson last week. You can open the dura, you may not open the dura. Some people used to just score the dura. If you do open the dura, then what do you do? Some people will coagulate the tonsils, some people resect the tonsils. Um, some people will uh, search for a veil, which, uh, which can actually be a very important pathology to look for. Uh, because it can obstruct uh, CSF flow uh, through the frame of Magendi. Um, some people used to leave stents, or some people uh, do leave stents uh, from the fourth ventricle leading into the outflow tracts. And so there's there's just so much variety. But I think at the most basic level, the one of the biggest questions has been: Is it necessary to open the door or not? And um, and I think you touched on some of the major points as to you know, what are the things that you might expect to be potential complications? Uh, if, you, if you open the dura, then clearly there's going to be an increased risk of a CSF leak compared to if you did a bone-only decompression and all the things that can go along with a CSF leak, like meningitis. Um, but as you said, a lot of the studies up until now have really been just retrospective uh, cohort studies or case series, and, uh, and we have not had a randomized control trial yet. And so, what we have had are some of these systematic reviews, and, and this is one of them that has come out. But as you pointed out, the limitation of any systematic review is going to be the quality of the studies that they're reviewing. And so that can, that can really become an important factor. Um, so if, uh, if you were to really try to design the, the best way to answer this question, because people have been asking it for so long, um, what, kind of, what kind of study would you put together, Michael? or anyone who uh, wants to jump in, we can have you raise your hand and, and unmute you. If you do a uh, multi-center uh, randomized control trial, a uh, double blind. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So I think um, that that's definitely the gold standard. I'm going to, let's see, someone is raising their hands. Let me try to unmute you. Clementine, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you, Dr. Hirsch. I will have said uh, the same thing actually, um, based on the the um, the fact that for these kind of um, um studies, of, well, such that that will lead to decision making. You know, you really need to have the most um, objective um, data as possible. I will go for a randomized control trial as well. Great, perfect. Yeah, so you guys are, are thinking at a high level, and, uh, and that is exactly what is being done now. So I'm going to share my slides again here. 
And uh, the Park Reeves uh, Consortium has organized a randomized trial where they're essentially looking at this very question, posterior fossa decompression with or without duroplasty. They're specifically looking at the subtype of patients with syringomyelia. As you can see, the inclusion criteria is age less than 21, so pediatric patients defined to have a KR1 malformation radiographically. Uh, they do have a syrinx between three millimeters and six millimeters, so moderate size syrinx. KRE severity index classification of one, which is a somewhat more straightforward patient. They've got the uh, classic KRE headache and, uh, and not a, a different set of, sim of symptoms. And uh, they must have had an MRI of the brain, cervical, and thoracic spine in order to define the syrinx. Some of the inclusion criteria, um, if they were essentially a more complicated patient, if they had some imaging findings suggesting that they could be unstable or require a fusion in the near future, um, if they had syringomyelia secondary to a different pathology, the, those patients are being excluded. And, uh, and as you see, the recruitment uh, status is that the study is actually completed and the data is being analyzed. So we're all really hoping to have the results of this study soon. I think it's gonna be extremely helpful in order to finally answer this question for people because although we know that posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty is associated with an increased risk of CSF related complications, um, what a lot of people have argued is that a bone only decompression may be sufficient in order to address the pathology underlying the KRA1 malformation. And, uh, and people feel very strongly on either side of the debate. Uh, and a lot of people have argued, uh, and I was taught in my training, that if you have a syrinx, that, uh, that is really the type of thing that can only be addressed with a dural opening. Uh, but like I said, other people argue in the opposite direction too. So that's, that's really what this trial is looking to answer. I think that even after we get the results of this, there may still be some unanswered questions because another paper that the, uh, the Park Reeves group put out, and so there we go, uh, just recently uh, came out uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, I think, dural augmentation approaches and complication rates after posterior fossa decompression. Uh, what they showed is that, uh, as Michael mentioned, the type of graft that you use, if you do a dural opening and then close it at the end, uh, the type of dural graft can make a difference. And so they looked at uh, four different types of non-autologous grafts. And uh, even within the non-autologous group, there were differences in the types of complication rates, including the rates of chemical meningitis and post-operative nausea and vomiting. And so I do think that uh, the rate uh, of complications, CSF-related complications may differ even within this randomized trial, depending on the type of dural closure different groups or in different institutions are performing. But nonetheless, I think it's gonna be a, a really, really valuable study. It's gonna be um, hopefully something that helps us answer this question after people have been asking it for so long. So more on that to come. All right, let's see. Are there any other questions from the group based on, uh, based on this second paper here? All right, well, we are going to move on to our third and final paper of the evening, uh, which is one of the Park Reef's papers, actually. It's radiological and clinical associations with scoliosis outcomes after posterior fossa decompression in patients with a carrying malformation and syrinx from the Park Reef's Stringomyelia Research Consortium. So we can go ahead and get those slides up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Tiffany. Today I'll be presenting on the radiological and clinical associations of scoliosis outcomes after posterior fossil decompression in patients with chiral malformation and syrinx from the Park Reeves Fingal Research Consortium. To begin, a little background to recap. Uh, chiral malformation type one is a downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils at least five millimeters below the foramen magnum. This malformation can then cause a blockage of the normal CSF flow at the foramen magnum, which can cause uh, sphingomyelia. So what is sphingomyelia? Sphingomyelia is a development of a fluid-filled cyst, also called a syrinx within the spinal cord. The cyst can enlarge over time and damage the center of the spinal cord. Now, there is an incidence of scoliosis being present in up to 30% of chiral malformation type one patients and an incidence of scoliosis of 
70% in those with cauri malformation type 1 patients who have an associated spinal cord series. According to Huber and McKinnon, in the setting of sphingomyelia, the pathogenesis of scoliosis may be the consequence of the destruction of the cells in the medial nuclei of the spinal cord by the enlarging syrinx, resulting in the denervation of truncal musculature. See in the picture located in the bottom left, you'll see the middle motor nuclei located in that area in each of the levels of the spinal cord. So in order to provide treatment, the, uh, the surgical intervention of choice is posterior fossa decompression. This procedure involves the removal of the back of the skull and spine. As you can see, uh, the items labeled in red in the bottom right image. A number of studies reported that there is an improvement or stabilization of scoliosis in those who underwent posterior fossa decompression with 18 to 70% experiencing post-surgical curve progression that required additional intervention such as spinal fusion. Other studies found that at the age when the decompression was done and the severity of the curved spine, pre-decompression, there were implications for curve progression. So however, there were limitations like small sample size affecting the power of these studies. Also, the fact that this disease is rare affects the power of those studies. And there were also inconsistencies in reporting radiological parameters and lastly, most of the studies were performed at single institutions and not over multiple institutions. So this is what the researchers sought out to do. They wanted to determine baseline radiological factors, including cranial cervical junction alignment that might predict curve stability or improvement after posterior fossa decompression. So, the methods included using a large multi-center retrospective and prospective cohort registry of pediatric patients at the Park Reeves Fingomyelia Research Consultorium. This consultorium is a multi-institutional North American research effort founded to improve the medical and surgical care of children who have sphingomyelia related to the chiri type one malformation. Through the collaboration of orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons, they work to enrich the lives and prevent the disability in those who, affect, who are affected by this condition. So furthermore, there were 31 centers and patients who were 21 years and younger. There was a total of 825 patients in the study cohort, 313 were recruited retrospectively and 506 recruited prospectively. They included those who had a chiro malformation type one, greater than five millimeters below the former magnum, who had related scoliosis and sphingomyelia and who underwent posterior fossa decompression. And they had to have an imaging follow-up in 1.3 years. So they analyzed demographic information such as sex and age at the time of surgery and used Pearson correlation and chi-square tests to compare these variables. So now moving on to the results. There were 41 patients of chiri malformation type 1 sphingomyelia and scoliosis who underwent decompression surgery. Out of those, 23 patients were females and 18 were male. Their age at diagnosis ranged from a minimum of 2.6 years to a maximum of 16.1 years. Their mean age of diagnosis was 9.81 years and for decompression surgery it was 10 years. Patients also had an average follow-up duration of 2 years and 10 of these patients ultimately had to undergo spinal fusion. Postoperatively, there were three groups with respect to curve conditions. These curves were stable, progressed, or improved. You can see uh, three of these at the bottom of the table on the, on the screen. So nine of those patients had stable curves and they had changes in Cobb angle of less than five degrees in either direction. In 16 patients, the curves improved with a decrease in Cobb angle of at least five degrees. In another 16 patients, the curves uh, were considered to have progressed as they showed a change in Cobb angle of greater than five degrees. So the percentages of these groups were 22, 39, and 39% respectively. So if you focus on the table here on the right, you'll see that there is a column for variables, curves and p-values, 
each with their curves further classified into stable, improved, and progressed. The strength of relationship between each variable and the curve is given by the p-value and p-values of less than 0 0.05 are considered significant. Given the 23 females and 18 who underwent posterior fossa decompression, we can see that, that this table showed that there is no difference in sex distribution between patients and all of these curve groups. The mean ages at times of decompressions for stable, improved, or progressed curves postoperatively were 11.9, 7.9, and 11.5 years, respectively. And the correlation between age at decompression and changes in curves following surgery were significant with the p value of 0 0.05. So you can also see that the patients whose curves improved were significantly younger than patients whose curves remained stable or progressed. The mean curve angles, Cobb angles at presentation were 33.4%, 28.4%, and 36.1% for stable, improved, and progressed curve groups, respectively. And there is no association between Cobb angle at decompression and change in curve following surgery. But there was a trend toward curve improvement in cases that involved smaller baseline curves that is to say for curves less than 35 degrees, only 17% of patients less than 10 years had progression compared with 64% of those greater than or equal to 10 years. So even at age 10 years, curve improvement was possible if the baseline curve was small, but there was no difference in progression by age for those with curves greater than 35 degrees. Uh, the thoracic, thoracolumnar, and lumbar were the three curve locations that were the greatest Cobb angle, and there was no difference in their distribution among those three curve groups. The left-sided thoracic curve had no association with scoliosis progression or improvement following decompression. Additionally, post-operative treatment where with braces with first scoliosis did not give any additional benefits. So neither the sphinx width nor sphinx length a diagnosis had association with improvement or worsening of curve post-operatively, but the patients with Curve improvement had a greater decrease in Sphinx width after surgery compared to patients with stable curves. Sphinx width decreased by 60% in the improved curve group and by 30% in the stable curve group with a mean change in Sphinx width of 4.5 plus or minus 3.6 through the follow-up period. The clinical radiological parameters at presentation as PBC2 distance, tonsil position, Clevel axial angle and frontal occipital horn ratio were similar among all the three groups, and they were not associated with in change in curve after decompression. On the right, there is a graph between change in curve and age at decompression with change in curve on the y-axis and age at decompression on x-axis. Following the diagonal line here, we see that at age 10 value, on the y-axis is zero, which means that the curve remains stable after decompression, whereas with increasing age at decompression, the curve progressed or worsened. But for younger ages, the curve actually improved. So there is positive correlation between change in curve after surgery and age at decompression with p-value of 0 0.009. So there were a couple limitations of the study. It was a large cohort that addressed the question of scoliosis progression following posterior fossa decompression, but the sample size may still be too small to detect other important associations. The follow-up duration of two years was short for the younger patient population who may not have reached skeletal maturity and some may have progressed after the follow-up interval. Confirmation of scoliosis was possible in only a limited number of patients. There was a limited follow-up imaging in some patients, which further reduced the statistical power to detect association between clinical radiological parameters and changes in curve after surgery. All patients in this cohort had chiral malformation one with sphingomyelia, and therefore could not, they could not evaluate scoliosis outcomes in chiral malformation type one patients without the strengths. So to conclude, this cohort was able to conclude that a younger age at time of decompression, especially less than 10 years of age and curved 35 degrees or, or less was associated with post-surgical curve improvement in patients undergoing posterior fossa decompression for chiral malformation type one, sphingomyelia and scoliosis. This study also concluded that these 
the baseline tonsil position, shrink size, frontal occipital horn ratio, and cranial cervical junction deformity were not significant predictors of curve progression or regression after surgery. So that is all I have for today. I want to thank Dr. Hirsch for his guidance and staff for providing uh, us with this opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was, that was wonderful. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes left for tonight, and I just wanted to uh, talk very briefly about this paper. You know, I think that I really wanted to include tonight at least one of the Park Reeves papers. And um, I'm going to just show you my last couple of slides here. I think it's important to know about Park Reeves. We talked about them briefly uh, after the last talk, actually, and, uh, and Tiffany gave an uh, overview as to who they are. But um, just to give you a little more information, the Park Reeves Stringomyelia Research Consortium is a, a really large multi-institutional North American network of different researchers who are interested in stringomyelia research, and a lot of that tends to overlap with TRD malformation research. And if you look at the list of investigators, it's uh, a who's who of pediatric neurosurgeons across the country um, and a lot of names that you'll recognize. And essentially, uh, the Park Reeves Consortium, uh, as part of this big multi-institutional network, they can answer questions that are really tough to answer if you're only looking at a single center study. A lot of the problems that we deal with uh, do not come along that frequently. In order to get the numbers to provide the power that you need for your statistical analyses, it's really important to pool different institutions' data. And I think that's the model that we're moving towards in a lot of different diseases within neurosurgery. Um, and so the Park Reeves Consortium is one of them dealing with tarry malformations and stringomyelia. You'll hear about the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, the HCRN, dealing with various research-related topics in hydrocephalus. Uh, there's now a synestosis group that's looking at craniosynestosis. And the list goes on and on. Um, there's a, a spine interest group as well. With all these different problems, having the brain power of all these different individuals and having the data from all these different centers really increases the power uh, and the types of answers that you can provide. And so uh, they do have a number of ongoing projects currently. One is the randomized trial that we were talking about after the second talk. Um, they're looking at the genetics of QRA1 malformation. And you can see here some of the other research projects that are ongoing. So I'm going to ask, um, you know, a, a quick but tough question, uh, Tiffany or, or anyone else in the audience who wants to answer. If uh, if you had a patient who came in who was 11 years old with a 45 degree curve, you know, what would you tell them? This study told us that 10 degree, 10 years of age or less, and 35 degree curvatures or less are going to be more likely to improve after a TRD decompression. So let's say you were a little bit over those thresholds. Would you offer them a carry decompression? Would you tell them that you know the evidence shows it's probably not going to help them? No, it's, it's a tough question. Want to take a stab at it, Tiffany? Sure, why not? Um, you know, I think you have to go by case by case scenario for patients. Um, of course, using evidence based data to always support what you, you know, decide to do. Um, I think that should they not fall in within those, um, um, you know, that just like that format of what works and what won't work that maybe if you see that it's fit or that you see that it, it, it could work in your experience as a physician, then by all means, I would recommend it. Um, but, you know, everything's not concrete. Not everything's black and white because research changes. So maybe it could work, but it's not, nothing's like permanent. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer here. Um, Clementine is also raising her hand. Let me unmute you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Hurt. I actually, I agree with what um, Tiffany said, but I would also add that, um, you know, the, the evidence shows that, you know, there's enough data to support the fact that um, um, the decompression will work if we have to get to that point. But 
Um, as we said at the beginning, I think not all patients with um, KRE1 um, malformation will need the compression from the get-go. So uh, personally, or like with the team where I work, I, I would um, you know, analyze all the parameters. Is the patient symptomatic? You know, is there a syrinx or not present? Um, you know, are there other things like other comorbidities that we should be aware of? And then if we get to the point where, um, you know, we need to do the compression, then the data from this study, um, um, you know, combining the, 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 the scoliosis curve and the, the need for the compression or uh, improvement of the, the spinal curve, you know, will come in handy. But I will definitely look at all the other factors and deter to determine first, does this, would this patient even be, you know, a good candidate for surgery and then take it from there. Great, thank you, Clementine. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think this is a particularly tough one. I do think that a lot of people now recognize that scoliosis can be a, and specifically certain types of scoliosis can be a sign of a KRD1 malformation. And uh, like we showed in the survey uh, paper, there are differing opinions, but um, a lot of people would agree to offer surgery for a significant scoliosis that was thought to be related to KRD1 malformation. Uh, I think when we have papers like this that are showing us different cutoffs for the patient population who it may or may not be effective for, um, it can create some challenges. And, and I think that when you're faced with a borderline page, patient like that, uh, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I do think it's important to be able to counsel the family effectively. And having data from a paper like this is really important to be able to explain to them what are the risks and benefits of surgery? What are our expectations for success? Um, it doesn't mean that you have to offer it or that you definitely shouldn't offer it, but I think it does, it's helpful in providing you with some numbers that you can use to help educate the family about, um, you know, what do we think are some of our expectations for a surgery like this, and what are the types of things that we have to do after surgery in order to continue to monitor the patient and see if they end up going on to progress and need other interventions as well. So I think papers like this um, are really important, and, and I'm sure we'll continue to see more and more like this from the Park Reeves Consortium in order to help figure out what are some of the more definitive numbers that we can use to help us educate our families. So great job, Tiffany, on that. Thank you so much to everyone tonight um, for, for participating and for presenting these papers. I think it was a really valuable discussion. Um, KRE1 malformations are something that you're going to continue to see throughout your career and uh, they're gonna get very comfortable with treating these patients. This is just the start. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.